Instagram is casually familiar with how we met. Um, but I just think that what you do is so incredible. And honestly, some shit that I would have probably done. And I'm like, why didn't I think to do this first? <laughs> like when I met you, I was just like, this seems like something I should or sh should have been doing. <laughs> but um, so please um, introduce yourself, tell my audience who you are, what you do, and why. Sure. So I'm Claire Foyer. I'm the founder of the Subway Social Club. And basically, um, I encourage people to talk on public transit with strangers. And I do it because um, I think there we have so much going on. We have so many biases, I think, about other people, um, you know, as, as human beings. Um, especially in New York City, especially on the subway. And um, I think as soon as you begin to have a conversation, you immediately realize that so much of like what you're projecting or, or your thoughts um, are really just not true. And so I do, our, the Subway Social Club started really to bring people together and to connect people um, in a place where this formal conversation is rather taboo. Um, and so part of it's really a practice of kind of getting ourselves out of our comfort zone, getting ourselves talking to people that we don't wouldn't normally talk to on a, on a regular basis, um, and also kind of challenging ourselves. I think once you begin to become comfortable with having conversations with strangers, that's kind of when the work begins, because it's not who am I talking to, it's also who am I choosing not to speak to. And that process is also really reflective and eye-opening. Um, and then once you begin to do that, you can begin to kind of switch, switch who you're talking to. And then again, kind of um, helping to break down biases that you have. I didn't even think of it from the perspective of working on our biases. I think with so much going on, well, you and I are both people of color, whoever's listening to this on the podcast or watching this on the YouTube channel, you can, you know, see, but if not, you know, I'm, obviously black and um Claire is Asian and I I think for us a lot of shit's always been going on but it seems like the world can, started to become aware when um post George Floyd and then there was Breonna Taylor and then there was the stop Asian hate right but like we've been saying something's not right in this world for a really long time and I think a lot of people were like you know, white people suddenly became aware that things aren't great and non-white sure. people became aware that things aren't great. And they started reading all these books and listening to, we're listening and we're learning and we're listening and we're learning. But a huge part of that is breaking down your own bias. And I didn't even think about the fact that this is an exercise in doing that, in that's how we explore connectivity within the world and within the community because New York is such a diverse place um and for me coming from Atlanta that's not that diverse it's just a lot of black people um you know it initially for me was like culture shock and I didn't recognize um how uncomfortable I felt being around people who are different from me. And it wasn't even discomfort in like, oh, I don't want to be here. It was a fearfulness because I was trying to explain to someone else the other day that sometimes you walk into places and you're like, did I walk into a clan meeting that I don't know about? Because there's yeah. this energy. Do you know what I mean? There's that do, energy yeah. of, I don't feel like I'm supposed to be here. I know that I'm allowed to be here, but I don't feel like I'm welcome here. And I would get that so often in New York, because, you know, I love a fine dining experience, experience which you and I talked about, like, we spent most of our subway ride of me giving yeah. food recommendations. <laughs> That's my love language, I guess, like, I don't know where you can party, but I know where you can eat well. And I know there are some, like, fine dining establishments that I've gone into, and I walk in, and everyone is, like, kind of giving this look of, like, are you lost? And it's, like, no, sweetie. I have money to spend and you go take it. Sure. So, yeah. Um, and so I really am just so appreciative of how brave you are, not only in the fact that like New York is not what it was in the 80s, of course, 
but it still is a very brave act to just talk to people when they really just want to get home. And then especially as an Asian woman, when there has been a visible spike in what's happening to Asian people. So talk to me a little bit about how you overcome the physical fear of talking to people because it's hard to know like when someone's a safe space and when they aren't and also like what that's like from your unique perspective as an Asian woman right now. Sure well I just want to say thank you so much for sharing um, kind of your experience and also I think it's experiences a lot of people feel about feeling excluded or feeling kind of in a strange place where, where you really shouldn't have to feel ever. Um, in terms of kind of talking to a stranger, I'll be, I'll be honest, it's still kind of, it's still difficult. Um, and it's still a little bit scary because, you know, I think you are, you're taking a chance. And I think in, when we want to be safe, we do, like, we follow routine. We talk to our friends. We talk to, um, right? So it's kind of like where we um, feel comfortable kind of, um, but it's scary still because you never know what someone is is going to say. And I think part of that fear or part of like that, like chance of, oh, I don't know, um, just kind of goes into, because I've got like not like pretty much 100% of the conversations I have actually end up being great. Um, and you so- You haven't that, had any like terrible experiences yet. I haven't, no. Oh, praise God, not on wood. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And I've been doing it for about three years. So okay, um, and the more you do it, I think what you realize is there will always be this little bit of fear, but like that fear ends up actually turning into relief, which also turns into joy as soon as the conversation oh. starts. And I say that because and I think having this fear is is a little bit of fear is great because what you're actually ending up doing is you, you, uh, you begin to gain a lot of confidence in how you start conversations. Um, and I think rejection is also great because what you end up doing in this platform or on this train is like you're microdosing yourself in small bouts of rejection and um, you then become resilient. So I always, for conversations, I always start with eye contact. Um, eye contact is key and then a smile. And if someone makes eye contact with you and then smiles back, that's automatically, that's automatically like, okay, that's like a go forward. You can begin to talk. Mm -hmm. um, and then I always usually pick out something like um, an article of clothing, but I think the, and I think it's more about your mindset and training your mindset. So when I do social consulting with, with people who have social anxiety, I always bring them outside of the train. So we start outside of the subway and it's about one, um, kind of again, microdosing in, in rejection, basically. So making eye contact and smiling. And the more you do that, the more you realize like so many people are also looking for eye contact and a smile. Um, and how many people are willing to do that? Um, and it exists underground as well. Um, but then I also suggest um, having a mindset where you're looking for similarities. And it can start small. So like when you walk around, you look for, okay, what like connects me to this person, even if you don't talk to them. And usually when you begin, you begin, oh, that person's wearing the same shoes. Like we have Vans, they have Nikes, I'm wearing Nikes. And then it gets like broader and broader and broader. It's like, they're wearing a sweater. I'm wearing a sweater, a jacket to the point where you're like, oh, they're a human being. I'm a human being. Um, so I think when we train ourselves to look for similarities, because I think our identity is somewhat wrapped in differences. So like I identify um, as an Asian woman, whereas my father would identify as like a white man. So like in that sense, it's very natural, I think, for our brains to go towards we are who someone isn't. So when we begin to oh. train ourselves to do we are and they are, it becomes so much easier to think of community. And then again, like you get bigger and bigger and bigger. So, and as your confidence grows, um, you begin to realize that like people are people. Um, and there are a lot of similar things we have in common. That's not just physical. So Brene Brown has this, do you know who Brene Brown is? Yes, 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 yes. yes. I, lo I love white Oprah. Um, but, <laughs> you know, with more credentials, I love her so much, but she has this really great um, series on HBO right now 
Um, I don't know if you've seen it, but it's- I have not. It, oh my God, it, love, love, highly recommend. Um, I haven't finished the whole thing because you know, her topics are a little bit like, oh, okay, I need to sit with that. So it's not sure. something that I, I could binge, but I don't want to because I want to sit with the things for a minute. And um, you're aware and my audience is aware I'm still- grieving a very devastating loss in my life and I started watching that because I just needed something I don't know I need something but she had one where she um one of the episodes is talking about um how to properly empathize with people when you talk to them and so she does like this exercise with um one of her researchers where um, they act out a person ha- being kind of in emotional distress, needing to talk through something. And she was saying that when you pity someone versus sympathizing, empathizing, whatever, you're actually creating a difference between you and that person where it's, oh, I'm so sorry that that right. happened to you. And it kind of lends itself to as if it wouldn't happen to you. But if you can look at things from more of the perspective of, we are both people and this is like a human thing that happens, it takes out the pity because you don't ever want, you don't really want to pity someone when they're in emotional distress if you actually want to help them through it. And so you know how it is like when someone comes to you where it's like, oh my God, the worst thing happened, blah, 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 blah. I think a lot of us are becoming more aware of how quickly we make someone else's trauma about ourselves. And you mean it in the best way possible where you're just like, oh, the same thing happened to me and this is how I handled it. And it's like, that's not always the, so she, you know, that's basically what the episode is about. But I love that, that you said that of like, we identify ourselves through our differences instead of recognizing the human element of it first. And like, I do think that we are all in general kind of going through the, the same stuff. And it's people who are, so very completely different from you like on paper or demographically but we're all really having very similar experiences so like when I first moved to New York I started blogging about like what my experiences were here and there were people back home who were reading those articles and I would visit and they were like oh my god I'm so glad you said that like me too and I was just like I don't really like you but we had this yeah it was people who I just didn't have right you know, everybody's not your person and that's okay kind of thing. And, you know, but them saying, I didn't know anybody else was going through that. And I was talking to this person and they were going through the same thing. And I really thought that I was the only person and that just connectivity of it's not just you is so important. I also like what you said about rejection. I think everyone needs to learn to have a better relationship with rejection but I especially think that's true for men so that they can stop killing us. Um, small ask. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Small ask. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. 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 I, I think that that's a huge um, key yeah. in the fight against like patriarchy and, and all of those things is like, if we can all just be okay with the fact that everyone's not gonna really like love us, you know, that has to be okay. We gotta be okay with that. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I think also it's too, it's like, I don't know. I, I was just meditating yesterday and, and it was, I like realized like what it meant. Like I felt so at home and kind of like what it meant to feel at home um, was a very interesting experience. Wait, so tell me more. I don't, I'm, I'm trying to like think about it. And this is, this is something that I'm going to, as I, I'm going to, I jotted down in my like book, my therapy book, which you, you inspired me to do, um, to make the most of my sessions and, um, to remember, but I don't know, there's like this sense of being at ease. And I think, um, at comfort and something I've been starting to do too, is kind of write these gratitude letters, um, to my friends and my family. Um, but I think it was just, just kind of realizing I, I felt at peace, um, especially during this time has been interesting. Yeah. I think um, that was hard for me too. I was telling someone the other day where when, when I first moved to New York, I would fly home to Atlanta once a month because my mom just retired from Delta. So I had, you know, flight benefits and I would fly home once a month because that just felt 
like my home base. I felt, I didn't feel like I belonged in New York. And it's like, I knew that I was here for mm-hmm. a reason, but it was just so hard when I first moved here. Mm-hmm. And I would, you know, I was sleeping on my line sister's couch and like relying on her for everything. It was really, really hard. So when I would visit home, that's where I had my bedroom and my car. And, you know, I, I felt very tethered to Atlanta. Mm-hmm. And at a certain point, when I really leaned into and accepted like, no, I live in New York and I need to learn how to feel at home here or like have home within me here. Mm -hmm. At a certain point, it switched to where this feels like my home base more than Atlanta. So um, after my brother's funeral, um, everybody was like, are you sure you don't just want to move back home? And I was like, after this, no. Uh, (laughs) And they were all really scared for me to come back to New York because your family and friends don't really think anyone can take care of you except for them. And they were like, I just feel like you're going to get in that apartment and be by yourself. And it's just going to be so hard. And I was like, maybe. And so I was like, I was expecting that when I opened my door and I walked in, it was going to be a very dramatic thing where I was going to do a wall slide and just like collapse into a puddle of tears. But when I walked in, I felt like, oh, okay. Yeah. I needed to be back in my space like that that ease and that like once you build your own space and your own home whether it's external or internal when you get there you just know like it just feels like even when things are terrible you feel just more at ease and so that's been like one of my go-to like my I think we talked about this too of like um more than like a- affirmations, like just like mindfulness kind of things that you say to yourself of like, you know, may I be whatever. And one of mine is, may I be at ease? May I live in ease? Because I don't think that we really, I think we discount the power of ease, especially in New York where hustle culture sure. is so, sure. yeah. Sure. Well, thank you again for sharing. Um, showing up, I, I was thinking about like what friendship means and kind of like how we are kind to ourselves and I think just showing up and kind of with with grace and it's really like for for ourselves too so thank you for taking the time to to spend with me no of course it was one of the better expert like I'm obviously a talker I've been getting in trouble for talking too much my whole life um and so that's all my report cards but like Jessica is very bright but you gotta teach her to shut the fuck up and my mom just I think about like fourth grade was like what y'all want me to do she has things to say I, I what y'all want me to do so I can have a conversation with a brick wall but to actually And I don't remember where I was going or coming from that day, but to actually sit down with a person who's on the same wavelength as you, where it's like, oh, we're just really being kind to each other. It was just so reaffirming. And it was just one of the more, one of those magical, positive New York experiences. Like, I think New York is a super magical place. Like, I went for a walk with a friend, like I live for a long walk, like not even on no rom-com type shit. I really love a long walk. And my friend and I walked um, from my place to Prospect Park and we just so happened to run into Smorgasbord. And he was saying, I really want to try that Smorgasbord thing. Like I'm trying to like, you know, love New York more, da, da, da. And it's like, it felt like he spoke it up. And I was like, oh, you know, we just passed the sign for it. And he, I, he was like, no, where was it? I was like, we could just go back. I didn't know you wanted to go. And we just, you know, had this amazing food. It's like one of those magical New York experiences. Yeah. So yeah. I felt like meeting you that day was a magical New York experience because it's like the kindness and the warmth and your genuine curiosity of like, oh, well, tell me more. I just thought was so beautiful. And I was like, I need to know absolutely everything about this person. Like, tell me everything. So, okay. So where are you from originally? I'm actually originally, well, I was born in China and then I was adopted. So then I moved when I was a baby to New York. So I grew up in New York, in New York City. In Brooklyn, Warm Hill, Brooklyn. Okay. Okay. Yeah. You're actually like a New York native, which is rare. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody's yeah. <a> transplant. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Have you ever had the desire to live anywhere else? Or does this so, make you want to live anywhere else? So I, 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 so I think I was a little bit, I became like as soon as I, so I started the club and the idea for the club in 2019. 
And I think in 2019, it was when I was becoming like super jaded. I was like, I need to experience something else. I feel like I know New York, with New York City, which I realized was me just being very naive and, and not exploring. But I think that's also why that desire to experience new things. And it's why I kind of, I had, again, like shifted my mindset and then realized it's not necessarily, like what is consistently changing? It's the people. So as soon as I began to have that shift, like I fell in love with New York City again and, and kind of like the curiosity um, and, and the drive that people have when they come here and, and just being here. Um, but I did live in Jersey City and which is not very far. It's like seven minutes on the path train. Right. So it's like kind of like the additional, you know, like the sixth borough, but I would love to live there again and then be able to like pop in and out. Um, yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's just such a special place. It um. is. I feel like people either love it or hate it. Like I have friends where like New York is just dirty and it's, and I'm like, yeah. bitch, you dirty. Hold on. Like <laughs> I feel protective of it now. Like it's, it's the strangest sure. thing. I'm like, yeah. you know, and I refuse to call myself a New Yorker. I've been here for 10 years, but I refuse to call myself a New Yorker because I love being from Atlanta. I'm a New York right. resident, but I'm right. a alien forever. But I, I, I think that it's just such a, the energy of it is, is love or hate. And I think maybe that's why I like it so much because yeah. I'm apparently a polarizing person. People either love me or they really, really, really don't. I don't, I can't believe, I can't imagine no one liking you. <laughs> oh girl, <laughs> that's lovely of you to say. Um, those people are there we don't know them we don't care about them but they are there um and I think maybe that's that might also be a huge part of why I like it here so much too because it's like yeah same these honey <laughs> and it's also I love that people kind of refer to the city as being in like an abusive relationship with the coolest man in the world mm -hmm. um because it, it kicks your ass sometimes like when I first when I was first living here, whenever it would rain, I would be like, I have made a terrible decision because it, it's so inconvenient. And I'm not a good right. enough driver right. in Atlanta to drive here. And you right. just feel like everything is just an uphill battle. And I got to carry all this shit up all these flights of stairs and that I've made a terrible choice, you know, but then you have just like these magical days. So one thing that I did want to tell you, I, of why I was like, this seems like something I should have done. Like, Many, many moons ago, um, it had to be at least six years ago, um, I was on the subway and I was just like going through like the worst, like heartbreak or breakup or something mm. like that. And it was one of those situations where like the person wasn't your boyfriend, but you felt like this is really over. And it still wasn't over after that, but should have been. Anyway, another story for another day. And I was sitting there. And there was this, this couple, um, these two guys, I think it was like during pride. And this guy was like humming this really lovely tune. And I was like, what are you singing? And he was like, oh, it's a German love song. And it's about um, something, something about like two lovers that are, you know, something and then like they find each other, whatever. And I was like, oh, that's like the worst thing that like, I don't even want to hear that right now. And he was like, no, that'll happen for you. And it was, he was like an older guy and it was just such a sweet thing. And so he like wrote down some of the words for me and he was like, this will happen for you. And I, like, I could cry thinking about it because it was just so sweet. And I, I literally put that in my like gratitude jar that we were talking about. I yeah. still have that little slip of paper like in the, because it was just like, I was in such like a, a dark place that day and just like a, a complete, like an older white German gay man. <laughs> like, you know, we have no demographic, you know, similarity just like gave me just this piece of just like something that the everyone in the world is not terrible. And, you know, you absolutely like have those moments and a lot of them do happen on the subway. Like, I, and I think too, cause there is a huge difference in the way people interact in the South and in the North, but cause in the South, everyone is, Hey, how are you? So good to see you, right. and, you know, whatever. I still feel like I get that here. And I do think that you get what you give. Uh, you right. know, there are rude people everywhere, but I can't really say that I have had, you know what I mean? I, I do right. think that if, if you have a certain intention, 
people reciprocate that in a positive way. But then I don't know if you get this when you have this these conversations with people. Do people ever tell you that you have pretty privilege and that's why you're able to talk to people? My best friend does. Okay, how do you yeah. tell me about that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think too, and, and it, we can bring it back also about being Asian and kind of doing this work as an Asian woman. Um, I think at first, I, to be honest, like when people tell me that, or when she had told me that, I, I was like, I got offended. I was just like, I think, I think we spoke about this too. It's like, it's not just like, I think there are some like psycholo- like physically, psychologically, um, you know, we are drawn to, we can be drawn to some people who we think are just very attractive and are more lenient with, with that. So I, I don't want to discount, right. The fact that I am Asian, that I am, you know, that I'm not a black man on the subway, um, that I'm not like six feet 10 or whatever. Um, but I think that's right. I come off as like a very, just like innocent person who could be lost, could not be lost. Um, but so I don't want to discount looks in general. Um, and I think having looks comes with a privilege. Um, but I think that's why I feel like the Subway Social Club has to exist so that people who do not look like me, people who um, can feel can feel safe without it being like, I need to look this way. Um, and that's why I feel very passionate about it. I also think there's a lot of energy work that goes into it. And I think that's partially why I felt like when I get a little bit offend, offended when my friend says it, because you can go on the subway completely like with a mask, wearing like the frumpy, frumpiest clothes. But like, if your energy is there, like people can feel that. And it will do, it will speak more than just what you look like. You like wear a hat. I mean, basically cover all your face and, and just go with the energy of like, I am here, I see you. Um, and that will do wonders. Um, but again, I don't want to discredit um, looks as well. Cause I think, right. Like I, I don't think people, there are assumptions that people don't have about me because of the way I look. And again, that's why I feel so passionate about this club existing um, so that regardless of what you look like. I mean, that's why I think it's so important to go in with this curiosity and this mindset of, it's not what you look like that I'm, what I'm interested in. It's like what you have like inside, like your stories that are unique to you that I wanna hear. Um, and that, and I think are, are worthy of sharing regardless of what you look like. Um, yeah, I'm curious what your thoughts are too. No, I, I have a, a complicated relationship with beauty and it's something that I want to research, but I don't even know how to begin to research. Right. So whenever I have the opportunity to talk to someone about their relationship to aesthetic beauty, I, I do. Mm-hmm. Cause for me, I didn't, I literally was having a conversation with some people the other day, um, literally after the funeral, like a bunch of our friends were there and um, they were talking about, uh, whether or not someone had gotten work done because the Mm, person looked mm. different and I I still don't know who they were talking about I'm gonna send a text but anyway um and I was like I think that I have gotten better looking as I've gotten older because I like myself more now and I think you know also we didn't have access to the things that we have access to now in terms of like eyebrow techniques like I'm 34 Mm -hmm. so when I first got my eyebrows waxed it was they came out circular and very thin and it was like it didn't follow a brow bone or anything it was just vibes (laughs) (laughs) no just vibes and so you know I think you get older and you get access to more of like oh what works uniquely for you and I think that like I cut I used to have really long hair I had short hair for like five years now and I love it and my friends were like but Jessica you've always been pretty and I'm like I don't think so and they're like no like we're telling you you've always been pretty and I'm like maybe I didn't know it you know and I I feel weird I still struggle with people telling me that I'm pretty or I really cringe when people say that I'm beautiful because I'm like, oh, mm-hmm. that don't feel mm-hmm. right. Like it just, yeah. it, it, if you grow up your whole life not feeling that way and someone tells it yeah. to you, it, it's, it's weird. And so for me, especially being from the South, 
And being a brown skinned girl, I became really, really, really aware really early on that I'm not the preference, that lighter skin is the preference. Now, Mm -hmm. I didn't internalize that because my mom sat me down in fourth grade and was like, listen, it's just because they're light skin. That's it. You know, like, so I never even had the chance to internalize, oh, brown skin is less attractive. That's not a thing for me. I know that that's the preference, but I didn't internalize it. And so growing up, my two best friends are, are, you know, fairer skin than me. And everyone always thought that they were prettier than me. And I was like, Mm -hmm. it doesn't seem important to try to change anyone's mind just be something else and so you just develop a personality and a sense of humor and it's great so for me I I the question I always arrive at is how much does it actually matter that a person is or isn't beautiful like what really right I know that there are systemic things of like more attractive people you get hired more and and all of those things right but attractiveness is so subjective because Hollywood has been telling me that certain white women are beautiful for a real long time and I'm like (laughs) explain it to me like I'm five because I don't see it like I don't want to you know I think that it's harmful to critique women's looks or whatever so I won't name any names but there are like a-list actresses that they're like oh she's this great beauty and I'm like according to who who are these people you know so it's so subjective so who gets to determine what you know and even looking at like the Anna Delvey story like you know the invincible Anna whenever white women scam or white women perform horribly in the world it's oh she was so beautiful no she wasn't So to me, it's not even a real thing. It's just something that people say. And I don't understand how something so subjective can carry so much weight. And so when people have told me before where I have said, oh, no, I love talking to people. Like I, it's, I'm so curious about people. I want to know everything about everyone all the time. And they're like, you have positive experiences with people because you're cute. And I'm like, or and hear me out, I'm not an asshole, like (laughs) you are for what you just said, you know, it's like, well, sure, and maybe this is the same thing that white people encounter when you tell white people that they have white privilege, where they're like, but I'm also a hard worker, and both things can be true, bitch, both things can be true, you can both be a pretty Mm -hmm. person who's not a terrible person, and that's also something that I have a hard time with, because I, I do have a theory that the trope of the pretty girls in high school being terrible people just came from the fact that all the people who were writing those movies didn't feel pretty in high school so they made them the bad guys I like I I hate that I hate I hate the way we relate to beauty and that you automatically say because the other the flip side of that is if people think that you're beautiful they also don't think that you're smart they don't think right. that you're capable. Right. They don't think that you have right. anything to offer other than that. So what exactly is the privilege? What privilege right. do you think I have that you wish that you had? You want to be right. hit on more by people? You know, so I, I think it's a whole thing. And I can understand you being offended by it because it's like, no, I'm just a lovely <laughs> person. And like, I couldn't even see your face when we met. Like you, yeah, you were wearing a mask. So I didn't even know what you looked like at all. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. I, I couldn't agree with you more. I also, like, when I think of, I, I am very much in tune kind of, like, with loneliness, and I think of, you know, like, my mom is older, my aunt is older, and I think, like, as we, I also have, like, a very complicated relationship with beauty, but, like, as we age, like, I think the, the type of environment I want to create, too, is, like, her, my mom's spirit, she's older, she's, like, you know, wrink, wrinkles are starting, but, it's like, it doesn't matter. It's like her energy. Like she can walk around and like, she, and, and I think like that is, but like, she's also talked about kind of like ageism exists and um, especially in New York city where, or, and maybe even today, but um, so does loneliness and loneliness and ageism kind of go hand in hand today, um, which I think is really sad. But I think the subway social club is also about that. It's about kind of saying like, this is a club where you don't have to be, you know, 20 to 30, or, you know, you can be older and like still be able to have like and pass your wisdom on. Um, 
and then so that's like one thing about kind of like aging too and, and kind of aging gracefully not just physically but just in general where like you feel like people want to hear your story and you want to share it um but the second one is so I was bullied in high school partially for being Asian and I think it got to a point where the the girl ends up leaving the school and I like looked at myself in the mirror and I was like I will never feel this way about myself again and I think after that is like when I began to shift and I began to realize like I am a beautiful person, both inside and out, and I am going to embrace it fully. So I think like when people say, or like when my best friend has said, like, you're like, it's just because you look that way. It's also like, I, I go back to this time where I was like, no, there's like so much there. I put in so much more work to gain this confidence to go up and talk to someone. And that process of the confidence is and process you know I mean so it's like when you discredit someone just for their looks for doing like you like you said like having this courage um the looks don't do it like the actions leading up to it um kind of get you in a position um where you can do that because you can be beautiful but be an asshole and like no one's gonna talk to you <laughs> no one wants to talk to I don't know if you've seen so yeah. like sunset no, no, I haven't. I'll, I'll have to check it out. I will check Guilty it out. Guilty pleasure. Guilty <laughs> pleasure. Selling Sunset is a hot mess of just like. So the premise for anyone who is unfamiliar, it's um, a real estate agency in LA and it is the most LA shit. Like it's wild. <laughs> like the girls come to work, like they go into the club, like the boobs are up to the chin the face is b the you know like the hair is violently blonde it's like it's, it's aggressively la right and i say that as someone who in my spirit i feel like i'm a drag queen like i love to put on makeup i love to dress up it's like i live for someone to text me be like hey do you want to go to such and such bitch just tell me what i gotta wear like yes i'm there like that's my vibe and like it, one of the girls is just one of the worst people I've ever seen. I mean, like she's a, she is true. Like I feel like she is like a, she's like a Disney villain almost. Like it's wild. She has like no self-awareness. She is a complete narcissist. And then she had a baby and I was like, bitch, somebody got to go get that baby. That baby not okay. Um, and I she, did. huh? check in with the baby check in with that baby that baby not okay so she's what people would consider to be a gorgeous gorgeous girl she's like I swear she gotta be like six feet tall she's very thin with huge boobs and she has what I'm pretty sure are artificially plumped lips and you know like full eyes full lips and big eyes and huge all that stuff and again aggressively blonde and she dresses well to some people, sure. Um, it's it's a bit costumey for me, but you know, no one can get past how horrible of right. a person she is. So you can have all of the things that America says you're supposed to have to be beautiful, but you gotta you gotta carry it. And I kind of feel this same way about how people feel about Cardi B not mm. writing her lyrics. And it's like, here's what though, not everyone can perform. Sure, sure, so yeah. She's not without talent. You know what I mean? Like, right. totally, totally. You still gotta be able to, you know, finish the, the race. Somebody might've passed yeah. you the baton, but you gotta finish the race. And so I do think that, and for me, people have become less attractive to me once I see that their personality is terrible. Totally. So, yeah, so I'm like, I think beauty can get your foot in the door, but at, at a certain point, you got to be more than pretty. Yeah, I, totally. You just do. And it's even like looking at some reality TV shows or whatever. And people are like, oh my God, I, I live for such and such. I love such and such. And I'm like, gorgeous girl. That's all I got for you. Like, I, it, it, I don't have anything for people who don't have substance, you know? Right. But I also, you know, have a situation where um, some of my friends think that I am in love with one of my male friends, right? And I'm like, I'm not attracted to him. And they're like, but isn't that, I'm not attracted to him. Well, don't you feel, I'm not attracted to him. And I cannot, like, it is a thing. Like, it's not yeah. something that doesn't matter. 
you know, but I right. still think that our relationship to it is so complicated. And especially for women where it's like after 30, it's like they want us to run out into a field and disappear or they want to shoot us in the middle of a field. And it's like, you're done. You don't have anything else to contribute. It's like at 30, bitch, <laughs> as women of color, we, we age so well. And people are always like, can you believe that this person is only, is, is 40 years old? And it's like, how, what do you think a 40 year old looks like? Yeah, she's not 40. Like, what do you, what do you think? And <laughs> someone posted a picture of like Vera Wang without filters, without makeup or whatever. And they was they were like, oh, that's, yes, she's an older woman. It's fine, everyone. She's still yeah, an iconic yeah. designer who is, is still able to walk in like seven inches. She's still a bad bitch. Like, it's fine. I would like one of her uh, dresses one day, one day. <laughs> Listen, who among us? I too, you know, <laughs> I would love to sit at Vera Wang's table at the Met Gala, if anyone's listening. <laughs> You know, I, I, I think I just, I wish that we didn't place as much value on beauty, but it is also this thing that like, if you don't see it, you don't see it, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. I also want to ask like, are you helping to have, because everywhere where it doesn't have subways, obviously. Sure, and sure. So are there ways that you want for people to carry on Subway Social Club in, you know, other places where that's not a thing? Yeah, so I think public transit is so important. And I think also like these waves of tax against Asians, I get, I mean, policing and adding more police in the subway, right? Like the subway has become for some people, like the shootings, like a place that is just doesn't feel safe. And a lot of people are like texting me when um um when the shooting happened and they're like like yeah. don't ride like you shouldn't ride and my thinking is like this is when we need to exist because and and I like the fear I like I am sometimes afraid sometimes just like I and I watched I was on 14th at 42nd street and as an Asian woman like I started to like look around me or like move towards the middle of the platform and I remember watching and, and a group of Asians and like the, someone passed by and um, one of the guys tapped this, the girl who's also Asian to kind of like make sure that she was aware. And that's when I realized like, holy crap, like this needs to change. And I don't, and I mean fear in general, because it's, if you feel, feel fearful, one, like the, the subway is how we move. It's how we get around, it's how we operate, it's how we navigate the city. So um, for it to feel unsafe is also kind of a huge, I think, equity issue. It's like we need to feel yes. safe in these, basically these these public palaces. Um, the second thing is though is if you feel afraid, um, you're also kind of targeting the other person because you're like, I'm afraid of this person, and even if that person didn't do anything or like was just walking to an exit, so it's just misplaced fear. Um, that I that I think is we just can't have um, because again that's like also adding in this like this bias of and and encouraging us to have this uncalled for or unjust bias um, so I think that's why the subway social club actually needs to step up and do more um, to, and I think we're in a good place to do it because we're not the MTA so I think we can come from it from an outside in perspective. Um, the second thing though about like public transit in general is, I mean, we're also in a climate crisis too. So I think if you can take the bus and, um, you know, can you take the, I love the bus. The bus is a great place. Cause like you also get to experience kind of life above ground, which is also uh, like just blue skies or just not underground. So I think that's great. But I think the subway social club, it's more about like a mindset than just the physical infrastructure of the subway like we're tapping into it here but I think it's about talking to strangers um and I think that mentality or that shift we should be doing more of in general um so it doesn't have you can I, I've actually had people buy pins who live in LA who live in Arkansas who live in Florida where they predominantly drive um, but they still have that mentality of like hey I want to I'm open to talking and I'm actually starting another company um, 
Oh, is this breaking news? This is breaking news. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, it's called honorary kin. Um, kind of as in kin, as kind of as in kinship. So, yeah. so um, it's about celebrating. Um, I think Subway Social Club is about encouraging people to talk to strangers. Honorary kin is about um, kind of honoring our existing honorary kin. So both kind of get to kind of this connection component, but um, are just kind of different ways um, to do that. Um, so yeah, so honorary kin is is again, about kind of expressing gratitude and saying thank you to the people who have grounded us, who help us, who support us, who show up, um, who aren't necessarily biologically related to us. Um, and then kind of like through that is kind of how, right, you meet a friend who introduces you to another friend, who introduces, introduces you to another friend. So you're still connecting with, with, with people. Um, yeah. But yeah, there, I'm I think- sorry, that just means a lot because- yeah, Desmond wasn't my biological brother, but like, and I, his mom will kill me for even saying that because she very much considers me her other daughter. And like, yeah. that means, I'm so sorry. That means so much. That's such a beautiful oh, thing. Well, so thank you. And you are my honorary kin. So <laughs> thank you for being my honorary kin. Um, yeah, I think, I think nowadays we're like, it's, you know, I came out from, I really started too because I was in an emo like during when I saw you I was kind of I was coming out of an emotionally abusive relationship where I could didn't really feel so you were actually kind of like one of my first conversations um and like on the subway but I realized like I didn't have the bandwidth to talk to people um but kind of so I realized that like the people who helped me so much were like my friends and that support system. So honorary kin is kind of an extension of kind of like where I went through in my life and realizing that it's very hard sometimes to talk to a stranger. And sometimes all you really do need is a smile um, or eye contact. Um, and so honorary kin is about kind of honoring the people who, who make life like the joy that it, that it is. Yeah, that's like the best thing. I feel like that has to be like a good place to stop. It's like the best thing because I, I think, you know, it's, we were, someone was talking about that on Twitter or whatever, yeah. just even talking about like the way that like companies view like PTO and stuff like that, where it's like, they don't really understand that just because someone is not like a biological, you know, direct, whatever, it doesn't mean that they don't have the same value to you, you know, like as family. Sure. Um, and I think that biology holds us hostage in a lot of ways, you know, where, again, that's biology is where a lot of biases come from. And, you know, like we even see that in like mortality rates for like black women who are, you know, having children and, and stuff like that. Like, it's not right that women are dying at that rate. Like this isn't the 1500s, you know what I mean? Right. Um, so I think sometimes I really do feel like biology holds us back a lot from, um, from connectivity and I don't think that family should just be limited you know especially when you look at like the LGBTQ um, sure. community a lot yeah. of them have had to have chosen family and are you right. saying that their chosen family is somehow less valuable than the people who put them out and, and don't accept them um right. I think our our definition of family has to um expand a lot more so I really really love that idea and and just you know giving people the power to show up and I say this also just like as a single woman I think that um people don't value single women in community as much as they should um and a huge part of um what was also really hard about the grieving process is that you know being mm -hmm. from the south all my friends are married or par are partnered and um, the expect when your friends get married and you're not, you know, like you're not even partnered or whatever, you kind of make this quiet acceptance that you take a step down or like it's a step mm -hmm. back in terms of their priorities and their right. life, you know, like their husband, their wife is supposed to be the number, the number one person. And I'm not saying that that's wrong, but I think that there also has to be space in your life for other people to matter. Um, sure. and you know, you have to find a sense of community 
where you're still a priority. So it has been important to me to have like a diverse group of friends where like not every person is a wife and a mother because I could just be sitting there like, y'all want to do karaoke or, or what we doing? You know what I mean? <laughs> um, so it's, yeah. I, think, I think chosen family and community is, is really important, especially that's, I don't know how we are still, I can't even say came out of the pandemic because we're still in it, but at this phase of the pandemic where people don't, understand the significance of community like how can you know you know I, I really wish that people have more of a, of a community mindset and I think that sometimes as Americans like our independence really works against how sure. you know important community is to um, a society's ability to thrive like you can't say these people are less valuable because they haven't met the one yet it's like fuck off right. Um, right, right, totally. So how can people, um, or do you want to leave any like last notes um, before like you plug all of your things and, and whatnot? Um, one, I, again, just want to thank you for your time and to all everyone who listens. Um, thank you for showing up. Um, just being here, it's been it's been wonderful. And, and seriously, you, I do consider you my honorary kin. Oh. Um, I would say just. For anyone, for anyone listening, um, do some small act of kindness, whether it's for yourself, someone else. Um, and if you are able to take a ride on public transit, um, do. Um, but also just have a enjoy the, get some sunlight. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Soak in, soak in the sun um, is a form of self care too. Yeah. <laughs> So how do you want um, for people to keep up with your projects sure. and to connect and everything, plug all of your socials? Yeah, so there's on Instagram to Subway Social Club. I'll be launching on a, and subwaysocialclub.com is the website. Um, and Honorary Kin will be launching in the next like three weeks. So stay tuned, but it'll be honorarykin.com is where you can find out more. And I'll be plugging it on Subway Social Club as well. I'm so excited for that project. Oh my gosh. It's something to look for. I always need a thing to look forward to. <laughs> I'm that kind of person. I'm like, what do I have to do in the next couple of weeks? Um, so thank you for your time, Claire, and for thank your you. kindness and your warmth and your just lovely spirit. We're all very grateful. So I also feel like we need to like meet up in person soon. Yes. And we have to do one, maybe one of the restaurants. Oh, honey, I have a running yeah. list. You ain't said nothing but a word. So thank you so, so much. And hopefully I'll see you soon. Thank you so much for having me. Of course. Bye.